And tonight we're going to finish up the series that we've been looking at for the past few weeks in Ephesians, the armor of God. And we've talked about that if we are going to live a life that is not of this world because we understand that we are living a life that is not of this world. It's a salvation that the Lord has brought to us through his Son. In fact, Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, it's a born-again lifestyle. Not that we enter into the physical womb again, but literally we're born from the spiritual womb, if you will, through faith in Christ, and we are anew. And if we are going to live a life that is not of this world, then we're going to need a power that is beyond this world. We're not going to be able to live in a way that honors God, walking in a worthy way or experiencing the fullness of Holy Spirit, which is everything that Paul has been talking about in this epistle. We're not going to be able to leave behind the former things of our life because that's what a born-again lifestyle is, is we leave behind our lifestyle in the flesh, and we have a brand-new lifestyle in Christ that is enabled by the grace of God through the indwelling power of Holy Spirit. And we're not going to be able to leave that former life behind and walk in newness of life and growing through the renewing of the spirit of our mind and speak the truth and be one and unified in the body of Christ. These are things that Paul has been speaking about in this letter to the church in Ephesus as well as to us. We're not going to be able to do all these things that Paul has been talking about in this letter in our own strength. It's impossible. We can't do it. If we could, Christ didn't need to come. Because we can't, Christ came so that we could have salvation in his name. And through salvation in his name, Holy Spirit would take up resonance. And now there's a new law that Paul talks about in Romans 8 that is within, at work within our lives. So as Paul is concluding this letter to the church, and we've looked at this, and he stated in Ephesians 6 and verse 10, he says, finally, and we understand that Paul, in using this word finally, is not an afterthought in saying, okay, now by the way, after I've said all of this, I also want to throw this because I forgot to know. He's saying in conclusion to everything that I've said, now that you are living and you're walking in this newness of life, now... I want to affirm within you, I want to lead you, be strong in the Lord, Ephesians 6, verse 10, and in the strength of his might. Father, we just pray, lead us within your word, that, Father, your will would be done. Lord, that's what we ask. Lord, that individuals would not see us, but, Lord, they would see Christ in us. In order for them to see Christ in me or Christ in us, then that means it's like what... John said, John the Baptist says, I must decrease that he may increase. And Lord, that is our prayer, is that each and every day we would decrease and Christ would increase in our lives so that when people see us, they would see Jesus. They would see the hope, the hope that was given to the world through faith in him. Lord, we ask and we pray it through your spirit. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. In this born again life, Paul says, requires the strength of the Lord. And he says that if we want to enjoy the strength of the Lord, which is, it's, it's going to take to live this new life that he's given in his son, and Paul is saying here, we must take up the full armor of God. We know that when we became a believer, we alluded to this, we didn't step on a playground in fact, I heard Chuck Swindoll say this, and I love that quote. When we became a believer, we didn't step onto a playground. We stepped onto a battleground. And in order to be able to stand and grow and be all that God is destined for us to be in his son, we must put on the full armor of God, as Paul says here. Why? Because we have stepped on a battleground, and we have an enemy that is going to do everything within his power to prevent us from living the way that God wants us to live as his children and doing and fulfilling his purpose and his plan for our lives and for his kingdom. 
Paul goes on in verse 12 of chapter 6, Ephesians, says, For our strength is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And then in verse 13, he says, Therefore, since we know our enemy, and we understand our enemy is not of the natural means, it's not flesh and blood, it, he's spiritual, he's beyond us, any demon in hell is beyond us, therefore, Paul says, take up the full armor of God, the provision of the Lord, so that we will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. To stand firm, we must walk in the armament that the Lord has given. And for the past few weeks, from verse 10 to verse 17, Paul has been detailing, and we've looked at this, the believers our lives and the need to be full with the power of God and filled with him and to be clothed with the preparedness that he has given us through this spiritual armament so that we can stand against the enemy. The armor of God, I've heard in other avenues, represents in every piece that we've looked at I'm talking about the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the footwear, the shoes of peace which is the gospel message, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, as we looked at last one, is the sword of the Spirit. The armor of God represents attitudes. It it represents actions in Christ through the indwelling presence of Holy Spirit that we as believers now need to practice in order to win on this spiritual battlefield. And it's not something that just a few are engaged in, whether you're a pastor, you're a teacher, or a spiritual leader. You're not on the battlefield just if you're a pastor, a teacher, or a spiritual leader. You're on the battlefield if you're a believer. It's for all of us. In fact, Paul tells us, as we've been looking for the past few weeks, that there is no believer, no Christian soldier who can win without the armament that God has given, the provision that the Lord has given. That we know in Scripture that God has given us, already given us everything that we need for the fulfillment of his will in the spiritual life in Christ Jesus has already been given. So we've got to avail our hearts and our lives to what the Lord has already been given and allow it to be working within us and growing, that growing reality of Christ in us. We've looked at all that and the preparedness and the armor, and now as we come and Paul is bringing this letter to a close, we come to verse 18. And Paul adds one last element, if you will, to our battle strategy as servants of Christ. Because it's not about serving ourselves, it's about serving the Lord. It's what it means to be a disciple. And in fact, it is this action that Paul begins to speak about in verse 18, and he's alluded to it as well throughout the letter, but here specifically in verse 18 and the ones that follow, it is this action that gives, if you will, life to the armor. In fact, I heard uh, our former general superintendent, uh, Dr. George Wood, who has gone on to be with the Lord now, now, he says that it's this element that Paul speaks of in verse 18 that causes the armor that we put on to not be like some museum piece that is dead and lifeless, but it causes that armor to come alive and be active in our lives. And this tactic reminds us once again that Paul speaks of here that we do battle in God's strength and we don't do it in ours. Verse 14 through 17, Paul has described the pieces of armor that we've already alluded to, given to us by our Heavenly Father, and how that each piece is dependent on the other. They're connected together, all of them essential to win a victory over the schemes and the tactics of the enemy. And now, in essence, we could look at it this way, now that we're suited up for battle, what do we do? We're suited up for battle... What do we do? It's not like I'm all dressed up and nowhere to go. That's not what Paul says. So he leads us in verse 18 and says this, with every prayer, now that we're suited up and we're ready to do battle, with every prayer and request, Paul says, pray at all times. Every prayer and request, pray at all times. And Paul uses two words here, that that speak to our communion with the Lord, prayer and and request. One is a general term that we're going to look at and kind of dissect just a little bit, and then request, ever how it's translated in the version that you may have, it's more of a specific term in calling upon the name of the Lord. But let's look at the general term first, the first word that is given with every prayer. 
In fact, a more literal, if you will, in what Paul is saying here, way is he's, is he's saying it is through the means of prayer that we engage. And he uses this most common Greek word for prayer in the New Testament in this verse. And this word we find when we dig into it is used somewhere around 127 times within the New Testament referring to prayer. And in as we dig into it, we find that it is a compound word, and if this wasn't essential, I wouldn't bring it to you, but it's a compound word made up in the Greek of two words. And the first word that we find, and if you've got you version, you can see the word there for you. The first part of the word, this compound word in the Greek that is translated for us as prayer, it's a preposition. And it means toward. Toward. And it conveys a sense of closeness. In fact, it is used in the Bible to describe the intimate relationship between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. When the Apostle John speaks in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was here with God. And in fact, from what I understand, that some have translated this verse in John 1 as in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was face to face with God. And this word is used by Paul in Ephesians 6, 12 that we've just read to picture our close contact with the unseen, the demonic forces of hell that fight against us as disciples of Christ. If you look back at verse 12, he says, for our struggle is not, and here's the word, the preposition against, is translated as an against in verse 12, flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So the first part of this word that is translated to us as prayer in the Greek, it means, in essence, to be close to, and we could translate it as being face to face. Then when we look at the second part of the word, it's an old Greek word that describes a desire, in essence, a vow or something that is prayed. And it was originally used to depict a person who made a vow to the Lord. So when we take this word and we put it together, which Paul does in saying with all prayers, we find that he is telling us that prayer should bring us face to face and into close contact with the Lord. Prayer is more than just mechanical. It's more than just a formula to Father that we just recite something that someone tells us to recite, and it just involves our head, but it doesn't involve our heart. That's not what this word means, because it's through prayer that we are brought into a place where we enjoy a close, intimate relationship with the Lord. And this word also reveals that prayer is to be more than just something we engage in, but it's something we are. In fact, we could look at it since we understand that prayer is more than a mechanical act or a formula that we follow through, through, through this. It, it shows us that as we come to the place that we would call the altar, a place of meeting with God, that it is a place of sacrifice. It's a place of consecration. It's a place where we yield our entire self to the Lord. So we could look at this word prayer. There's so much that it's packed. I know that it's a general word, but we need to understand before we move further what Paul is speaking of, what we are engaging in, in all areas of spiritual warfare, in everything in our lives. That prayer is a place where we yield our entire self to the Lord. It is a place of decision. It is a place of consecration where we freely vow to give our lives to the Lord in exchange for his life. Everything that Paul has been speaking about in this letter to the church. And because this word that is translated for us as prayer in English from the Greek word, it carries the meaning of surrender and sacrifice because it carries this meaning. We can know that God desires to do more than just merely bless us. He wants to change us. He wants to transform us. And he wants to use us so that his change and transformation can flow through us and we can be vessels of that change and vessels of that transformation in our society, in our community, and even in other individuals' lives. 
He wants us to come to a place of consecration where we meet with him face to face and we surrender every area of our lives to him. So we understand what Paul is talking about when he says here in verse 18, with every prayer, with every prayer, that it is coming and meeting face to face with God. It's not mechanical. It's not something that is void of our hearts and who we are, but it is a place of sacrifice, a place of consecration, a place of decision to the Lord. And the point that, that, that Paul is making and ending everything that he's talked about, in essence, with the armor of God, is that he is saying here the point is that every incident of life is to be dealt with through what? Prayer. Everything. It's to be dealt with. Why? Because that's how we meet face to face with God. It's through prayer. Prayer is to be the habit of our life. It is to be the natural recourse of our life that when we're faced with anything or we're going through anything or whatever, we naturally pray. Why? Because we're not people who pray. We are people of prayer. There's a different dynamic, a different attitude in that. So we know that we are to pray. And that's what Paul says here. With every prayer and request, pray at all times. Not only does he tell us that we need to pray, but notice that he goes on to tell us how we should pray. With every prayer and request, pray at all times. How? In the Spirit. In the Spirit. So Paul is saying our watchfulness and, and our discipline through prayer is not just a matter of our human striving, but prayer for a disciple of Christ is prayer in the Spirit. And to pray in the Spirit means that we pray by His power. We pray according to His ability and not ours. And we pray according in agreement with His will because we find in Corinthians, you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, who knows the mind of God but who? The Spirit of God. Or even Paul equates it this way in talking to the Corinthians. Who knows the mind of an individual or human being but the spirit of that individual? And so we know that through the Spirit of God, we know the will of God, and we're able, as we yield and as we pray in the Spirit, that we can pray in agreement with God's Word and His will. And when we do that, what does Jesus say when He taught on prayer on the Sermon on the Mount? When we pray in accordance with God's will, we know that He's heard us. And not only that He's heard us, but what is He doing? He's moving, asking, seeking, knocking. In agreement with His will, we ask, we'll hear. We'll receive the answer. If we seek, we'll find. If we not, in accordance with God's will, what's going to happen? The Lord says He'll open the door. We pray in the Spirit. In the Spirit and, and being Pentecostal. Just the whole dynamic of the fullness of praying in the Spirit that, yes, it is in a language that it could be a heavenly language and an earthly language if the Spirit is praying through us. But we know that when we do pray genuinely in the Spirit, who are we talking to? It's direct communication to the Lord. Uh, General Superintendent, or I should say the district superintendent in Georgia, uh, a few years back, Roger Brumblow, I, I can't remember if I've told this story or not, but he had spoken of a time that he was at Southeastern and it was right when the Vietnam War was going on. And so he was of age to be drafted. And he said he did everything after he got drafted. Every school that he could go to, he went to so that he wouldn't have to go to Vietnam. Not that he didn't want to fight, he just so that he could do. He did everything. Sniper school, you name it, he did it. And then finally his name came up and they sent him over. And he says that each and every day he would pray. And one day he was off to himself as he normally did, and he was praying. He began to pray in the Spirit. And after he was done, one of his buddies came up to him and says, uh, says I didn't quite get the words that you were saying when you were praying. What were you doing? And, and Pastor Brumbelow explained to him. He says, I was praying in the Spirit. And the Scripture says that when we pray in the Spirit, we are in a direct line with God. We are speaking directly to him. And the guy just, I, he said he kind of snickered and laughed it off. Until a few days later, I can't remember a few days, a few weeks, but uh, I, 
he said that they were in about to land in a hot LZ. And so they got out, and they were under fire. I mean, it, they were just bearing down on them. And this guy that had asked him this question came with him, and they were, I mean, literally trying to get everything they could behind this tree because the enemy was firing. And they called him Preacher Man. And he says, Preacher Man, you need to call out to God. And says, Roger, he says, I begin to pray. And he says, no, no, no. I don't want you speaking in English. You need to speak in that heavenly language because I want God to hear you. We need help right now. (laughs) So in saying all of that, we understand prayer is coming face to face with the Lord. And the way we pray is in the Spirit. In the Spirit. And for us, (coughs) excuse me, as Pentecostals, We pray in the Spirit, in a heavenly language or an earthly language that we don't know. It's by the Spirit of God, but it's not so we can feel, as you know, the little doodads or spiritual goosebumps on our back. It's about getting God's will done. That's what prayer is about. And I love what Paul says in Romans 8, 26, 27. He says, in this same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. Aren't you thankful for that? Holy Spirit helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself does what? Intercedes for us with groanings. Too deep for words. In fact, we, we, we've talked about this. When we can't even get the words out, all we can do is just moan or groan or grunt. You've been there praying, haven't you? I mean, you are just so deeply pressed by a circumstance or an issue or a burden that God has placed upon you. You verbally can't get the words out. All you can get out is maybe a groan, and that's it. And Scripture tells us, God says through his servant here, that the Spirit intercedes through those deep groanings, if you will. And he verbalizes to the Lord God's will in that moment. Verse 27, and he, the Spirit, who searches the heart, knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saint, and here it is, according to what? The will of God. The will of God. So he tells us we need to pray because prayer is what brings the armor to life. We can be all dressed up and know where to go. We can be all dressed up and know where to go. There's no power. There's no life to it. Why? Because we're not praying in the Spirit. It brings life to the armament and enables us to be able to combat the enemy. So he speaks to the prayer and he speaks to how in the Spirit. And then also in verse 8, he speaks to what prayer does in the Spirit. What prayer in the Spirit does. He goes on and says that with all every prayer and request, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view... Our focus, our intent, our mindset. Be alert with all perseverance and every request for all the saints. What prayer does? It's through prayer that we keep spiritually alert. If we're not praying, we're not alert. That's the truth. As a minister or whatever, if I'm not praying, I'm not alert. If we're, as Christians, if we're not praying, if we're not meeting face-to-face with God and being specific and praying through the leading of Holy Spirit and praying God's will, we are not spiritually alert, and we can't be. The word alert, it means to be sleepless and to keep awake. To be sleepless and to keep awake. It means to be attentive and to be vigilant spiritually. Keep alert or watch was frequently the command of Christ, was it not? As he walked with his disciples, his inner circle, the three and the twelve, he frequently spoke to them about keeping alert and being watchful through prayer so that they would be ready for when he returns, but also they would be ready to engage in the day of temptation. Jesus frequently spoke this that they needed to find strength through prayer, especially in the hours of temptation. We alluded to this on Sunday, how that Jesus, he went a stone cast away from Peter, James, and John, and how he asked them, will you watch with me so that you will not enter into temptation? Will you watch with me? He came back. They were asleep. 
Because we know, as Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is what? Our flesh is weak. He found them asleep. He says, will you not watch with me? He was admonishing them. Will you not? Will you stay alert? You don't understand what is taking place right now. You don't understand the weight that I'm carrying, what is transpiring in the, in, in the spiritual. What is going on in the spiritual? There was a warfare that was taking place in the spiritual that they were not aware of. And so he comes back to the three and says, Will you not watch and pray with me so you will not enter into temptation and fail? And then Paul uses not only the word alert in talking about just the nature of prayer in our lives, just the spiritual alertness that it brings, but he uses the word perseverance. With every prayer and request, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be alert with all perseverance. And that word, it means to give constant attention to a thing. Constant attention. To give unremitted care to something. The word perseverance conveys the understanding that we are sticking to it and not quitting. We're sticking with it. Through thick and thin, we're sticking with it. We're not quitting. And to stand ready, Jesus admonished, and Paul, through the leading of God's Spirit, here admonishes us as he's telling us we're in a spiritual warfare against non-fleshly opponents that are stronger than we, so we have to stand in God's strength and put on the preparation that the Lord has given us, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace of the gospel, take up the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, so that we're ready to stand. And in that, we are to pray. To be ready for combat can be made good only, Paul is saying here, when prayer, constant, earnest, spirit-led prayer is a part of the arraignment of God's armor. Part of his arraignment. The armament that he's given us for us to stand ready for the combat and be made good is only through prayer. Constant, earnest, spirit-led prayer. But notice how that there is, or I should say this this concept that he's speaking of, this this last piece that that causes the armor to come alive and meeting face-to-face with God It's not selfish in its orientation, but it's community-minded. Again, verse 18, with every prayer and request, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be alert with all perseverance in every request for all the saints. Prayer is community-oriented. In fact, when we go back and look the disciples, and even we find in the Sermon on the Mount, when the Lord teaches us to pray. The Lord's prayer begins with what? Our Father. Not my Father. But it begins with our Father. Because we understand in the physical realm, when we're born, we're born into a family. We're born into a family, and when we're born again... We're again born into a family, a spiritual family. And so we reach back to the Lord teaching us how to pray, and we find the plurality of the Lord's prayer. It takes me, my, and mine out of our prayers, and it inserts our, us, and we into our prayers. In fact, when you look through the Lord's prayer, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Uh, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us, right? This day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. You see, it's, it's plural. It has the community in mind. And he is reminding us, Paul is reminding what the Lord has already spoken, and that is prayer is communal. It is community oriented. And it's Vitally important for the effectiveness of our prayer life, of which Paul is speaking of here, 
the effectiveness of our prayer life with the Lord to understand that self-centeredness will destroy my prayer life. Self-centeredness will destroy our prayer lives. We find here that even Paul is asking for prayer. Look at verse 19. He says, and pray in my behalf. He's asking them, pray for all the saints. And he says, I'm asking you as an apostle of the Lord, as the last one called, if you will, chosen of God, individual that was taken up to the third heaven and shown things that the Lord told him he could not tell. He says, I am asking that you would pray in my behalf. Pray that my speech may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness, confidence, the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of the gospel is what? God has sent his son to die in our stead. And it is through faith in them that we have right standing with God and are able to live a different life from this world. Verse 20, for which I am, talking about preaching the gospel, I am an ambassador in chains. Now notice that. In other words, he's a slave of God. He's a servant of the Lord. But it also speaks to the physical chains, if you will, that he has on because he's been arrested for his proclamation of faith. And he goes on in verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So he's asking for prayer. So prayer is community oriented. So as we just end this discussion tonight on spiritual warfare, and Paul ends it with the concept of prayer because it's prayer that brings the armor alive and enables us to, to stand against the enemy with all the provisions that God has given. I love what Isaiah 64, 7, when we talk about prayer, and its nature and what it is, coming face to face with God. But Isaiah 64, 7 gives us a picture of the essential nature of prayer in the life of believers. And Isaiah says this, in Isaiah 64, verse 7, the first part of the verse says, There is no one who calls on your name. And here's the essential part of prayer, what we are engaging in, who arouses Themself to take hold of you. So when we come to the Lord and meet face to face, we're not just going through a grocery list. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong. In fact, I have lists so I don't forget because you guys know how good my memory is. Nobody laughed. Y'all know my memory's not very good. So I, I do have lists that I can remember to intercede and to pray. But it's not just mechanical, and I just go down the list and I'm good. Literally, as I meet face to face with God, Isaiah says that I'm arousing. We are to arouse ourselves through the Spirit, arouse ourselves to take hold of the Lord. Not in demanding anything, but in seeking His face and praying that His will would be done in and through our lives. In fact, here in Isaiah 64, as I'm closing, The literal reading from my understanding of this verse in the Hebrew says that prayer is the action of faith to rouse ourselves out of sleep and to lay hold of the Lord. In other words, prayer is not a mindless observance. Prayer is the action of faith that seizes hold of all that God is, of all that God is so that God may seize hold of all that I am. All that he is so that he may seize hold of all that I am. Prayer is the action of faith that changes us. It's not about changing God's mind. It's about changing us. It's about getting on board with what God is doing and not about informing God about the issues of my life. Not that we don't bring the issues because the Lord says what? Peter says this, cast your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. So yes, we are to bring our issues to the Lord, bring everything that is affecting us, but we do so that we would get on board with what God is doing. Prayer is far-reaching because it is heavenly in its origin and earthly in its potential. Isn't that true? It's heavenly in its origin, but yet it's earthly in its potential. Because when Daniel prayed, In Daniel chapter 9, we read that 
archangels. Archangels were, were, were set in motion. And we understand prayer sets divine forces in motion in a way that we will never fully understand until we stand before the Lord in His kingdom. It means that we can't see with a physical eye. Isaiah 56 and verse 7 says, For my house will be called a house of prayer to all the peoples. And Jesus alluded to that as He forced the money changers out of the temple because they were perverting God's house, taking advantage of people that were coming to worship the Lord in the Passover. He says, has my, has my father not said that his house will be called a house of prayer? So we understand in looking at this, if we want to see spiritual renewal in our lives, spiritual renewal within the house of God and among the people of God, the, and the ultimate fulfillment of the Great Commission, because that's what it's all about. We have to align our vision of God's house with His vision of His house. It's a place where His people are found calling upon His name. It's a place that God's people arouse themselves to take hold of the Lord so that the Lord may take hold of all that they are. Because prayer is the key. It's the key to all ministry with which God has entrusted to us. It is the key. If we're not praying, we're not moving. We can't move without prayer. Prayer is the vehicle. Paul is alluding to in here. It is the vehicle that moves eternal realities forward, giving them power and authority in this realm because we are praying, Lord, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So as we come and we conclude this, the question is, for me and for all, is how seriously do we take prayer? How seriously do we take it? How often during the day in our lives daily do we commit to persistent, prevailing prayer? Or is prayer just something that I or that that you, that we just squeeze into our schedule? I know I have to pray, so let me just find somewhere to squeeze it in. But that's really not what prayer is. And I just squeeze it into my day because prayer is about coming face to face with the Lord. It's about seizing all that He is so that He may seize a hold of all that I am. And it's what keeps me alert spiritually and to preserve spiritually so do I engage in it do I focus time do I focus energy on the means of engaging in spiritual warfare because we don't engage physically we engage spiritually how do we engage in spiritual warfare prayer prayer. There's no other way. If we're not praying, then we're not on the battlefield. It's the truth. We're not engaging. It's prayer in the Spirit. Father, Lord, as we just come before you tonight, and I'm just so thankful just for your care and just for your heart for us, Lord. And that, Lord, it doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter what our abilities are. It doesn't matter about any of that. All that matters is our willingness to surrender, yield to you, and be obedient. And, Lord, as we just conclude, Lord, this study on the armor, the provision that you have given us, Lord, we can see the reality of darkness. Lord, we're faced with it every time that that maybe we turn the radio on and we hear about the things that are taking place in our society, in our country, in the world. If we turn the television on and we watch, we can see the effects of darkness. But Lord, are we seeing the effects of your light? And the only way we're going to see the effects of your light is by engaging in the spiritual warfare with the armament that God you have given and doing so through prayer in the Spirit. Remaining alert, remaining in a state of just 
perseverance and not being self-centered, but praying for one another, oh God. Lord, stir our hearts. Stir our hearts. I am so thankful that even as Paul says that when, Lord, we're not doing everything right because, Lord, you're constantly, God, stirring my heart. You're constantly stirring our heart and drawing us. That there is no condemnation. There's conviction, not condemnation. Lord, I just pray tonight, if we're not engaging in the way that we need to be engaging, if our prayers lives, Lord, aren't, God, what they need to be, are we meeting face to face with you? Are we seizing upon you, God, all that you are, so that you may seize upon all that we are, oh God? Or is prayer just something we squeeze into our day? Are we actively engaging in this warfare we pray in the Spirit. Lord, stir our hearts. Stir our hearts. Lord, speak to us. Can we just give Him a moment to do that? Can we not be in a rush? But can we give Him a moment to speak to us individually? Come on, reach out to him. Reach out to him right where you are. Just reach out to him. Let him speak. Let him speak. Let him speak to us. Let him lead us. Let him guide us. Let him stir us up. Let him stir us up by the Spirit of God that we would arouse ourselves to lay hold of all that he is so that he may lay hold of all that we are. Oh, God, we pray that. Lord, we pray that. Are we engaging? Are we engaging? Lord, for ourselves, for our family, physically, for our family, spiritually, are we engaging for the lost? Lord, are we engaging or are we just so caught up with this life and and preoccupied with with just the demands of life. God, that we're spiritually dull because our prayer lies. Am I spiritually dull because my prayer life is dull? Oh, speak to us, Lord. So, God, speak to us. Lord, draw us. Oh, quicken our prayer lives. Quicken our heart for prayer. Quicken our hearts, Lord. Draw us to you. Draw us to you, Lord.